Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom. Are my co-hosts today, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. Hi, Casey. How's it going? So once a quarter, we do a podcast on kind of a quarter in review. Obviously, um, financial markets are something that we pay a lot of attention to. We talk internally about it every week, but we try to do podcasts on various different subjects. But today we're coming back to, well, in a lot of ways, what we're here for, not just financial planning, but also money management. And we're going to discuss uh, the past a little bit, what brought us to year to date, and a little bit into the future. So I'm impressed. I mean, on January 1, did we think that the S&P 500 was going to be uh, up over 14% through the through halftime? I don't, I don't know that uh, we thought we'd be double digits this fast. Yeah, I don't think people saw this coming quite as fast as, as it has this year. It's been a very good year for the market year to date. You know, that doesn't mean that it's going to continue at the same rate, I'll say, at the same trajectory. But, but so far this year, I think investors have been well rewarded for keeping their money in the market and properly allocated with, you know, across different asset classes, large cap, small cap, international etc. So we're very pleased with the way the, the market has turned out and the way our portfolios were positioned to, for our clients to take advantage of this uh, year-to-date marketplace. So, you know, we'll get into the numbers here in a little bit, Casey. I think this is a, a good time to, to look back and say, okay, what, what happened this past six months and more recently these past three months in the quarter to, to bring us to this point? I like to add that one of the best things about indexing is the fact that uh, we don't have to make a whole lot of choices on sector rotation, on dollar up, dollar down. There's a lot of different ways you can play a portfolio or just, <laughs> or I hate that word play, but it, uh, yeah. <laughs> you can you can uh, strategically place a portfolio. I just want to remind all of our listeners that the things that people didn't want last year, very often the very next year they want, and that would be real estate and energy. So at the six month mark, We've got real estate up 21%, right, which is exceeding the S&P 500. Yeah. And then we have energy stocks up 42%. Who saw that coming? We didn't. Of course, you could also argue energy got so low last year that it's coming back. But the the, the point is, is yeah. that <laughs> you can't focus. You don't walk down the street looking at your feet. You're going to fall. You walk down the street looking ahead of you, right? Right. And that's what I feel like so many people do with their portfolios, especially uh, DIYers, um, is that they are picking things that ultimately cause them to trip. Well, we like to say around here, by investing in the index itself, we're guaranteeing that our clients are always invested in, in one of the sectors that's doing the best at any given time because it's in the index. We don't necessarily know which sector is going to do outperform other sectors at any given time or for how long or for which period. But by investing in the index, the the ETF in our case, or the S&P 500 IVV, we were in energy and our clients got that 42% for that portion of the that's allocated in the S&P 500. Right. And you don't want to chase returns. I think sometimes DIYers, if they're waiting to see what's doing well, and by the time they hop in and start to, to buy into that sector, it's uh, you know at all-time highs. So the time to participate was the whole time, but especially during lows when you're able to participate in that upside. Yeah, quite often when a sector begins to make a move, the best part of that move is at the beginning. Right. Okay, that surge that happens quickly early on in the movement itself and then begins to taper off over time. And by the time, quite often, DIYers, as we're calling here, see this move, okay, they've missed the first part. And that's why they don't get the full 100% movement that indexers get. Yeah, well, it's not even the sector; it's just the market in general. Oh well, yeah, yeah. It's almost it's human nature, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes into behavioral finance a little bit, but typically people will buy more of something at the top because they see that it's done well and they assume it's going to keep going well, and then it falls as it probably should uh, in a healthy environment. They get scared, they sell at the bottom, and they repeat that until eventually they're broke, right? Right. So, right. The thing here is 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 pay attention to what's happening in the market, but really. You're investing in broad indexes uh, and just focus long term. You have a 98% chance of beating any good stock picker, honestly, over a 20 plus year period. Right. Which I hope to be, plan to be invested through. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, for the past three months, the quarter itself, the second quarter of the S&P 500 was up 8% over the past 
six months or year to date, it's up 14%. So that, those are healthy returns for, for this period in time. With a one year at 39%. 39% for a year. Now, that's an unusual circumstance, but for the investors who were in, they got it. And that's what we guide our clients towards, you know, staying in the market through the bad times so you get to enjoy the good times. The uh, smaller caps are performing quite well year to date. Small caps are up 23% since the beginning of the year. They've cooled off a little bit in this past quarter. They're up about 5% in the third quarter. So we have a proper allocation, we like to think, between large caps and small caps to take advantage of these movements. In the past three months, of the 11 sectors in the S&P 500, 10 were positive. The only one that was slightly negative, negative 1%, was utilities. So it was a very broad gain for the quarter. But we're starting to see something here, Casey, that we wanted to bring up a little bit. And that being that the, the breadth of the market is narrowing a bit. We've noticed that in the, the first month of this quarter in April, 410 issues, I believe, of the S&P 500 were posted a positive gain. Then a little fewer than that, 300 and some in the second, uh, 317 in May were positive. And 218 were positive in, in the month of June. So it's something that we're going to continue to take a look at. But that's what we do as investment managers. You know, we want to see these trends and make sure that we're on top of them. Well, let's transition a little bit and talk more about um, the future. And, you know, the reduction in, from 410 to 218 in companies that are reporting earnings, positive earnings, goes right along with Vanguard's projection of the rest of the year. Basically saying it's been a great six months, but... The rest of the year, they kind of see us flat, um, to slightly up. Well, what what they're suggesting there is that the trajectory of price increases is going to change. And that's to be expected. As you have tremendous movements and positive growth movements in the stock market, what will happen at some point in time, the trajectory changes in order to compensate for high fast growth early in during the period and lower, fast, uh, lower growth in the later period for the whole period being more aligned with a long-term capital market assumption. So it's, it's just the math working out where you have high past returns, lower future returns, okay? but it all evens out over the long period in time because the returns are not linear in themselves. You know, they, they, they go up and, and they go down. So. so we have a lot of data here that we need to work into the conversation, but let's try to bring it home and make it a little more real. New money going into the market today. You know, why would you invest money at these all-time highs? Before we started recording, we, we were talking about um, the P.E. ratio, right? Mm -hmm. The price-to-earning ratio that's, that's something that we can look at on any company or the overall market. And really, it's not that high. Well, it's being supported now by the earnings that corporations are reporting. First quarter earnings were record earnings for a quarter. And they're expected to be similar to that, a little bit lower than the first quarter. But in the second quarter, they're expected to be fairly similar to that, which means that the price that an investor is paying for a dollar of earnings is what's called the P.E. ratio. So if it's in the low mid-20s, that means they're paying 20-some dollars for a dollar's worth of earnings. And investors are saying that corporations are expected to be able to pay that dollar of earnings, and so it's worth it to them to, to invest. The P.E. ratio is higher than it has been in the past within a standard deviation, I think, of, of, a, uh, of, a, of a normalized P.E. ratio return. But that doesn't mean that we can expect things to change in the future as long as corporations continue to support that P.E. ratio through their increased growth in earnings. On the other side of that is, is how we look at bonds, too. Mm -hmm. we're still showing possibly some stress in, on the bond market side going forward. I think we have still have to look at bonds as basically just uh, security in the portfolio. We're not going to get much yield out of those for the next probably 10 years. It's going to be a while. Right now, our bond portfolio is positioned to effectively mitigate any risk and volatility in the equity side of the portfolio, knowing, as you've mentioned, that we're not going to get the historic returns that bond investors used to see 10, 15, 20 years ago, that may be gone for quite some time. I mean, we're looking at, <laughs> at the beginning of second quarter, the rate on the 10-year had risen to all the way to 1.76, I think. Right. Okay. My goodness. That was the talk of the town. Everybody wanted to talk about rates are rising all the way to 1.76. By the end of second quarter, 
they were down below 1.5% again. So we're seeing some volatility in the rates as investors, bond investors, are trying to determine what's the future rate of inflation going to be. Is this inflation that we're seeing picking up in the marketplace? Is this transitory? Is this here here to stay? There's a, a, a bit of a tussle going on with bond investors. But when you apply a 1.5% rate of return discounted from the future back to today, that supports stock prices as well. Because the alternative, there's a risk-free rate of 1.5%. Yeah, very true. Um, I, there, there's a couple of ways you can tackle bonds. Uh, you know, we choose to stay in the bonds, but keep the duration or the maturity date lower, which lowers our risk. Basically allows us to reinvest the bonds into higher yields faster right? than what you traditionally norm- normally be able to do. But another way you could do it is you could almost eliminate bonds from our portfolio and you just build up enough reserves to cover your expenses. So you can go out five years with reserves on all stock portfolio. The problem is that most people can't stomach that kind of volatility. Also, there's always the black swan event that we, we don't see coming. So what is it we don't see coming that bonds are going to protect us from? Right. Nobody wants bonds until all of a sudden they want bonds. And you, <laughs> and you see it in the market. You see, you know, right there on my iPhone, I have a list of all of our ETFs. I have all the equities ranked by risk at the beginning and then the bonds ranked by risk at the bottom. And if it's all red at the top, it's typically all green at the bottom. That's right. 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 Now there's ways that you can, it's not cheating, but there's ways that you can take additional risk in bonds, which we don't do such as high yield bonds, merging market bonds um, to get higher yield, but you're going to have stock like performance out of your bond fund. Right. And, and we're that's looking not what for, you want. Yeah, we're looking to limit the volatility in the portfolio rather than adding additional volatility in the portfolio by investing in these bond asset classes that experience volatility along with the stock market. It's, now, right. it's supposed to be diversification away from equities is the point of a, kind of the bond portfolio these days. Right. But then there's, you know, what, what affects bonds the most? A lot, a lot of times it's uh, inflation, right? Because a, a bond holder is only going to get that coupon every single month or every single quarter, semi annually, however it's paid out, that doesn't change. Right. So if inflation goes up, that's going to hurt your bond value. So speaking of inflation, it's all over the headlines right now. Everybody's talking about, oh, this rapid inflation. Some people have it at 10%. Some people have it at 6%. But we were literally in a period where we couldn't spend money to create inflation for almost a year. And now things are just heating back up again. There's supply chain problems. Uh, we can't get the car we want we can't get the golf clubs we want we can't get the propeller that you're still looking for brad uh, <laughs> we can't get the propeller you want so I, I think you know the way we look at it uh, at least how vanguard's report is showing for the future is it they still have inflation between 1.4 and 2.4 percent over the next 10 years it hasn't changed so what they're believing is this is all going to be temporary and by the end of this year it'll kind of return to normal. Well, that's the same thing that the Fed Reserve is is saying as well, that that inflationary pressures in this marketplace are transitory, meaning that's going to come and go. That once the supply chain issues have been worked out, that inflation, okay, that's being caused by the fact that there's fewer goods, but more money chasing those fewer goods, bidding the prices up, that's going to even out and that's going to go away. And we'll go back to more a long-term inflation expectation that the Fed has said and is also Vanguard is saying as well. The other side to the inflation coin is that the money supply has been tremendously increased through fiscal and monetary policies that the current and past administration have injected into the system to bring us through the pandemic and the economic shutdown that it ensued afterwards. So uh, there's more money chasing fewer goods and there's people who have been out of work that are returning to the workplace. And so there's this this movement that's occurring within the market forces that is causing inflation to increase as people who are now have more money to spend are looking to buy the goods and services. They're having a hard time finding them. So they're bidding up the price in order to, to get them. We're seeing it in the housing market. We're seeing it in the, in the automobile marketplace. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about that. So I think that if you're a believer in the transitory effect, inflation should go 
back down to long-term historical norms. The Fed has also said that they were actually, at, you mentioned, Casey, trying to bring up inflation. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It just occurs. It's always been there and it always will be there. The idea is to be able to project it out and understand the forces that create it and to control those forces to the effect that you can, which is one of the two primary purposes of the Federal Reserve, is that to manage inflation and employment. So by having a projectable, if you will, inflation number, we can utilize that to determine is the P.E. ratio appropriate, are stock prices appropriate, are interest rates appropriate, et cetera, all based on whether or not inflation, which has a eats away at our purchasing power, is going to be in years in the future. We have Vanguard's uh, you know six month outlook here, and and, and basically it, it, they're saying the same thing. Inflation will be above the two percent target rate in the medium term, but as things return to normal, it'll come back down. Uh, you talked about labor a little bit, Brad. He had a really good point in our uh, pre talk here that I think there's uh, six million people. Um, well, there's nine point two million job openings, but six point one million people to fill them. Right. Which right. is, yeah, which is a phenomenon that doesn't often occur. Right. Yeah. But um, I'll let you make the point, but who are the employers competing <laughs> with? It's not just other employers. It's, it's not. I mean, employees are being pursued by two elements right now on, on, on an income sense. Employers and the government. The government's paying a lot of people in, in lieu of earned wages. I'm you know, not going to say anything about, other than that. Money. So the worker has a choice. They can continue to get government benefits at one price, or they can go back to work for another price. And they're saying, hmm, I'm going to wait until these equal out. So employers aren't competing with each other for employees. They're competing with the government right now. Yep, that's why you see the highest wage inflation in the services industry, to your point, kind of weighing out their options on, you know, the makes sense if you're getting paid equal amounts there. That's right. Um, payrolls rose uh, in the past quarter by $1.7 million bringing the, the total to 3.3 million additional job people going back to work this year. So we're seeing employment, you know, numbers fill up. Many states, I think over half the states in the United States, have ended federal benefits for unemployment at the end of June. So I think that now we're in July, August, September is going forward. We're going to see continued employment uh, occur. So as these people go back to work and they go, they're back to, you know, normalized you know life we should see the economy and some of these transitory effects work their way through the system as they're making products providing services to to the consumers yeah i, I think the unemployment rate is probably back at four percent by year end where are we at right now what 5.7 yeah we're up in the upper fives right now you know it changes because as more people get hired other people who weren't looking for work begin to re-enter the workforce looking for work. Right. So it's, it's, it's like the dog chasing its tail at the moment. What uh, I, I saw as a sign of improving economy, too, is uh, the Fed indicating that they're looking at raising interest rates in 2023 now instead of 2024. Right. That could even be sooner if it gets hot enough, you know. If the market heats up, you know, as you say, you know, anymore, it, it could be. I th- they're, they're, they're looking at data points, and those data points change. So they have the the right and they have the responsibility to make changes to go along with that so and that and that helps savers i think probably most listeners to this podcast um unless you have a tremendous amount of credit card debt and you're benefiting from lower rates and loans that helps savers that's when you start seeing the cds and the savings accounts uh increase again so that that's probably a good thing it is a good thing i think low low rates had created unintended consequences and we were starting to get back on the right path and then COVID happened right right you know, as, as interest rates, you know, go down, 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 for people who allocate capital, that would be business managers, et cetera, you know, they, they will say, you know, I'll try different things because money is so cheap right now. Okay? Higher interest rates sharpens the, the pencil a little bit for, for business managers. They make sure that they're allocating capital properly. I'll make one more point about inflation before you move on, that we have inflation, higher inflation pressures here in the U.S., but foreign they have deflation issues, uh, which is bad, um, and and they're starting to see that actually improve. Where they're less concerned about deflation in foreign countries, and starting to see some uptick in healthy inflation. Uh, so that that's something that we have to keep into account too. Is that you know we're we're a little ahead of the curve uh, in terms of COVID shots uh, received, 
than than certainly the emerging world. Right. But even other developed countries um, are are quite a bit behind us. Yeah, I think uh, we are in the transition. We're around fifty percent. Uh, one hundred and sixty million people are fully vaccinated in the United States. So over three hundred and fifty million or so shots have been administered. So there's a lot of people who have who have had you know at least one shot. I think I saw a statistic the other day where in Japan, where the Olympics are about to be held, that their national vaccination rate was down around 15%. Probably why they uh, aren't allowing spectators now. That could very well be. <laughs> but this is still a concern. It's still a concern for you know the, the economy, it's still a concern for forecasters, for businesses, for getting people back to work and fully engaged in, in this economy. Something that we're keeping an eye on. We look at trends. Trends are for vaccinations have gone down a bit on a moving average it's under a million a day now whereas it had reached a high of two and a half or three million per day that were being vaccinations administered so we're seeing a slowing trend we're seeing a slight uptick in cases Uh, we do see some variants out there we're certainly not specialists in this but it is a factor that we look at as we look through the the marketplace we make decisions for, for investing certainly i think being out of the market is going to be more costly than ever being in it so people concerned about tops. Um, I have less anxiety over that, honestly. It's it's really more about how much risk are we comfortable with in a portfolio because there's going to be some volatility. There always is, always will be volatility in the portfolio, but we have to make sure that um, we're not getting too conservative right now. Um, I, you don't exclude bonds from a portfolio, but if you had too many, you, I think you're going to be dragging a little bit relatively to inflation and uh, stock market performance. So, uh, you know, it, and I think we do that well here, but people who are listening here maybe not fully connected with us. Um, you just have to be cautious of that. There's a lot of noise out there. You still see all the clickbait on, on TV and online with articles talking about we're at tops and this is what you should be doing. So when yeah. you get close to all-time highs, the market's done this well, there's always going to be things out there that are insinuating that. You know, we, could, talk, we could have a whole podcast on that, but that, that makes know. that makes me really sad, actually. Yeah. But th- th- you got to remember that people always have something to sell. And and in cases of what Matthews is talking about is um, they're selling fear to move you their direction. Uh, and there's really nothing to be fearful of. You just need to educate yourself. Right. So this year alone, year to date, first six months, there have been 34 new highs in the S&P 500. So what would happen if the person at the first beginning of the year said, okay, at the first new high, it says it's too high. They'd have missed out on the next 33 highs in the S&P 500 index. So Constantly chasing it. You're constantly chasing it. So that's what you hope for, you know. Was it too high at 25, uh, the Dow on 25,000? Was it too high when the Dow was at 30,000? Now the Dow is at 35,000 or so. I remember Dow 20,000 thinking that was too high. Right. (laughs) But I'm the worst short-term trader probably. I'm terrible at short-term trading. I'm really good at focusing long-term and winning the race. Yeah. I I think uh, I saw a report in in Vanguard that, you know, they look at historical returns for uh, balanced portfolios. And you see this one case where the past 10 years, a, a balanced portfolio has, has never lost. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that the uh, 50-50? Yeah, the 50-50. Yes. You know, it's yeah. just a good indication that it, it supports the thought that a balanced portfolio over periods of time gain in value. Right. Yeah. You know, I was I was at a, a, a gathering on Monday night, and there's another, there's a, uh, asset manager there. He doesn't have client. His clients are it would be us, let's say. And he was talking a little bit about how the sixty portfolio is is probably dead. And I just couldn't help but chuckle a little bit because the sixty portfolio has been killed so many times. Yet when you run a sixty forty portfolio or fifty yeah. fifty, it's still risk adjusted. The best way to be investing your money over time. I don't know why people buy into that t- today's different than it was 20 years ago. It's, it's really not. Human nature is human nature, right? It's, it's like during the financial crisis, people were writing articles and probably books, if you look for them, Dow Zero, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then during the rebound, you know, it was Dow 30,000, which obviously we're there now, but no, we weren't, we weren't there in 20. 20- 11 or 2012. So people go to extremes and they do that. Uh, you know, maybe it's human nature, but maybe they're trying to sell their, their wares. 
uh, you just it's noise. You have to avoid it. You really do. It, it's like when whenever we have extreme volatility, I always I'll, I'll email our clients. Turn off your TV. Go play golf. Go get on your boat. Right. Go for a walk. Yeah. Right. Go work in the garden. Do what brings you peace and joy, because this is going to be fine. Yeah. It, 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 it'll always be fine. And if it's not fine. Then we have bigger problems. Then we've got with. bigger problems to deal with. <laughs> right. Right. We don't live in Venezuela. Right. right? So yeah. it's not like you can go out of business tomorrow and we're concerned about that. That's not who we're advising. So you have to keep a, um, a level head and, and, and focus on the big picture. And, you know, I think low cost indexing does that does that very well. I think it's a good combination. All right, guys. Uh, good chat. Uh, if you want to hear more, we've got bonus footage. It'll be on uh, our YouTube channel. You can find us, Wiser Wealth Management, on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the little bell on the right side of subscribe. Every time you uh, we post something new, you'll get an alert. Uh, Brad and I will be switching over there shortly to do our 5 and 20 for this week, where we cover five topics in 20 minutes uh, that we find in the news. And you can find some of Matthew's blogs on there about uh, taxes and personal financial planning uh, topics. Uh, So be sure to look us up there and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Wiser Roundtable podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss out on new episodes. Head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out if you have any questions. We would love to hear from you. Today's episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.